spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by, by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Again, if you're visiting with us, inside your bulletin you'll find little points to ponder uh, that you're willing, you're invited to pull out, of course, today because everything being changed. Um, but at the bottom there's a, a place that you can write down those things that God might put on your mind as we have this conversation together. Um, and as we begin, I would invite you to join me with a word of prayer. Holy and precious God, we invite you into our presence this day. Lord, seeking your touch. We all come from different walks and have different things going on, but there's one thing that's constant and certain, and that is that you travel with us. As we journey together, we pray for your spirit to enfold us and to open up our hearts and our minds to recognize um, your great love. These things we pray in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Uh, I'd like to begin with a story about a guy named Thomas Long. And Thomas Long was talked about when, uh, when he was involved in a church uh, that he had moved into town with, for, around. Um, he'd been there a few months, and, and he finally found himself at a covered dish supper with the rest of the church. And as he was there, he went through the line and found himself sitting with another guy that he'd seen around the church but really had no idea who he was. So they began to start talking uh, with each other. And, and the other guy says, so you've been here long? And uh, Thomas said, no, just, just a couple of years, you know, just trying to get filled in. He said, how about you? He said, yeah, I've been here for quite some time. Years and years, in fact. He said, in fact, would you believe I'm the only non-intellectual that's a part of this church? He says, Long says, you got to be kidding. He says, nope. I haven't understood a sermon in the last 25 years. But I'd never leave the church, the man continued. He said, why is that? To which the man that Long was speaking to says, you know, it's because I, I get together with some guys and, and we take the church band once a week and go to a, a prison that, that deals with young inmates. And, and we get together with them and, and, and play games and do Bible studies oftentimes, just, just get to know them. And, and I first started doing that because I thought that's what Christians did. But after a while, I realized that it did something for me as well. He went on, then on to say, he says, you know, you can't prove the promises of God in advance. But each time you use them, they can't become crystal clear. You know, believe it or not, I think in the past few weeks we have had a great opportunity to step out on some of these promises of God. I know we do so every week as we, we share our cares and concerns through, through our prayers, uh, especially ones that those, those are listed in the bulletin. But over the last couple of weeks, I have found myself recognizing a very heavy nature that, that's fallen not only on us as individuals or as a church, but really as a community. 
And in light of that, I felt myself really needing to, to change my message and share the one that, that, that I have today um, to kind of let you know what's been going on. And, and, and please don't let this be a depressing deal. This is just life. As I said, my, my sister has been diagnosed with, with uh, lung cancer. Last week, if you remember, we had a couple of former members lose family members. I had a two and a half year old girl drowned in a swimming accident. We had another 25 year old guy die unexpectedly. I know the situations of many here that are going through situations that are life changing to say the least. Pastor Michelle and I have had the opportunity to spend time with three individuals over the last few days in homes and conversations in hospital rooms that are really waging a battle of life and death through different forms of illnesses. And in all honesty, this is not a fresh off the press sermon that I'm sharing with you. It's one that I've done before. But it's one that that oftentimes speaks to me. And hopefully it will speak to you as well. As you and I and our world deal with just much of what it is to be alive. You know, it's been crazy in the last couple of weeks, and in all honesty, I think life's crazy. And as I've gone through the week, I find myself dealing with many questions that I think that all of us deal with. Is we're confronted with, with problematic situations. You know, we always ask the question, why God? Why did I go through this? Where are you in the midst of all that I'm facing? You know, when things get really tough, we even ask the questions like this, could, could God, real, could it be God's will to, to take my sister, my brother, my husband, or even my little child? You know, these are reasonable questions that I think reasonable people ask. And I think in the midst of some of the things that happen, as senseless as they may seem to us, that, that we try to figure out how God's will plugs into a world like we live. You know, next week we're going to start a sermon series on the questions of God, but, but in lieu of everything that's happened, I, I thought I might start it just a week early. You know, the question of God's will is one that's been debated throughout eternity. I mean, when you think about our life and all the things that happen, it's tough to make sense of, of, a, of an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God that's in charge of everything, but, but reigns over a world that is the way that it is. Many of us look at the, the suffering, the pain, the crime, the hate, the injustice, and we wonder where God is in the midst of all of those things. How could we live in a place that God created that had that much wrong with it? You know, I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to look back to the Scripture and understand there that the world in which we live is not the place that God had actually intended. In the beginning, there was the Garden of Eden, remember? And that's the place that God had, had created for us to live. And I think that Isaiah, as he spoke of, of what the coming kingdom, he was speaking of the coming kingdom, but, but the, the, the vision that he had of the coming kingdom, he took it from what God had originally intended for us. Ours to, was to be a place where the wolf and the lamb lived together in harmony. A place where the lion ate straw with the ox. Ours was a place that we ought to be able to leave our, our infants and our kids without worry of anything happening to them. But, but something happened in the midst of it all that changed everything. I love the story of the zookeeper. Oops. Uh, I love the story of the zookeeper who traveled around the country with the display he entitled the Peaceable Kingdom. And inside a, a cage there, he kept a, a lion and a lamb. 
And people were so intrigued by it, they came from all over to see this. And finally, somebody asked him, somebody finally asked him, so how do you do that? To which he just simply grinned. He said, it's easy. Each morning I just put in a fresh lamb. <laughs> You know, when you think about things like that, that's the kind of way that we see our world. It is what it is, but it's not the world in which God had envisioned. You see, in the beginning, God did desire our world to be free of, of problems and pain. But if you remember, it was then that Adam and Eve made choices that, that set them on a path away from what God had originally designed. With their act of disobedience, sin entered the picture, and we've been dealing with the repercussions of sin ever since. You know, our problems don't come from God's design, but our own sinfulness. And that sin is not limited to just what we do, but, but also can be found in, in the things that others do, and in the pain and the suffering that, that happens from a fallen world. I think we, we find ourselves really in a problem place whenever we try to make sense of all our suffering and, and look for something or someone to blame. And the easiest place to look is to God. I mean, if God intended it, surely we can find some comfort, some hope, or some peace for it. One of my favorite books is a book that was written by Leslie Weatherhead and it's entitled The Will of God and he wrote it because of a of a friend that he had that was a doctor who who had lost his wife to an illness and as he was going through he he did everything he possibly could to save his wife and at the end when she finally passed away his friend the doctor looked at Weatherhead and said well I, I guess it was just the will of God to which Weatherhead had a problem in, in, in dealing with that statement because in the weeks leading up to her passing, this doctor had done everything he possibly could to, to put those things and those people in her life to heal her. And, and he was sure that if, if his procedures had, had succeeded in healing her, that, that he too would have called that the will of God. And whether I had wondered if, if her dying was the will of God, if, if all the things he had done before were actually against the will of God. You see, it's hard to have things both ways. And in trying to make sense of it all, better understanding how God plugs into our world and our situations, whether had divided our, God's will into three categories. The intentional will of God the circumstantial will of God and the ultimate will of God. You see, God's intentional will for us was for us to live in an unbroken, loving relationship with Him. You see, His designs were and still are for us, His children, the best. Looking back on what God had planned for us, there, there was to be no pain. No despair, no suffering. It was the picture that Isaiah painted in, in the scripture that we read this morning. That was God's intentional will, but, but due to what happened in the world, things changed drastically. And it's there that we come to, to see and understand God's circumstantial will for us. It, it's through our misuse of freedom, our relationship with God was broken, and sin opened the door for all manner of suffering. It's because of, of our sin, not God's will, that we experience the, the sickness and, and the sorrow, the despair and the anguish that we go through. And that's the reason that God's intentional will was, was temporarily put aside. And I say temporarily because nothing can fully inhibit God's will for us. You see, God created our world as a world of order. And in creation, he put into place those forces that, that we depend on and use to let our world be the way that it is. I mean, take gravity, for instance. 
Gravity is one of those things that we count on that God put here as a good thing. And if you ever wonder what it would be like to go to work or to try to do things you're trying to not float off the world, gravity was a good thing that God put here for a purpose. But, but when those of us either by happenstance or choice take something like a heavy rock and toss it off a busy overpass. And that ga gravity that, that is so important for us to work and, and live and enjoy our life falls to the ground and goes through a windshield of, a, of an innocent passerby. The question comes in, could that be the will of God? Well, only in its most pure of senses. It was not God's will that would call someone to pick up a rock and throw it, but, but God's circumstantial will, His order, causes our world to work in certain ways. And that brings us to the ultimate will of God. You know, in the ultimate will of God, there it speaks of the purposefulness of God's love for us. And it states that, that even through our most painful and desperate situations, nothing can defeat God's love for us. Again, God desires the best for His children and he desired it so much that he even sent his own son that, that even in the worst of times we could find hope and help and healing. You see, it's through God's ultimate will that we, we find ourselves given these great gifts of, of knowledge, of fact. And through our faith, we, we proclaim that, that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and are called according to God's purpose. There's nothing in this world that can separate us from God's great love. Through Jesus Christ, even as we suffer and face all manner of persecution and problems. We can know that God sets things right in the end. You know, looking at all the things that, 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 that many of us are facing this day and the journeys that we've been traveling, the, the obstacles that lay ahead, wouldn't it be great if we could find that place that we could be protected from, from just the reality of our world. But the truth of the matter is that is not the world in which we live. You see, the world because of its fallen nature will always have the ability to shake up our lives, but, but it doesn't have the power to shake our faith. It doesn't have the power to shake our faith. I think it's important that we claim and know the fact that it's not God's will that we ever suffer, that we ever hurt. And I believe as we hurt, God hurts right alongside us, just as we hurt for our kids, our friends, our family. God's love walks with us and carries us no matter where we are, what we go through. That's a promise that, that we need to stand on. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for
the promises that we not only read about, but experience time and time again. Lord, so often it's it's difficult to understand just how powerful our faith is until we have to walk a painful path or struggle with those situations that are beyond our control. Lord, this day we ask that you would help us to to recognize your love and to allow ourselves to be fully placed in your hands that we might not only live but also share in your great promises.